So here we are on Tuesday morning, the 12th of March, 2003, and we are on our way to Natick, Massachusetts, to the parole hearing for Donald Perry. And the man you see right now is Reverend Stephen Philbrick, who is our driver and will be speaking today on behalf of Donald at the hearing. Let's just start by introducing yourselves and uh, and what's bringing you on this day to uh, to this hearing for Donald Perry. Do you want to start, Mike? Uh, sure. Um, my name is W. Michael Ryan. I'm a lawyer who practices in Northampton. I'm a retired uh, judge of the Northampton District Court. Uh, my son Luke was the trial judge or for the trial lawyer for Donald. And, uh, because he's involved in another case, he's unable to make the trip today. So uh, I volunteered to fill in, not as a lawyer, but just to advise some background or answer questions that people may have about the process, uh, about the procedures. Uh, Luke has worked it out with Donald and others uh, to conduct the hearing. I'll be available to answer any questions that people have on, on the process. Thanks. And the board can decide where he serves that sentence, including in the community under certain conditions. So in the parole board's mind, he's not entitled to a great deal of uh, a process. If I understand you correctly, is that he got arrested? Um, or, I, we know that he was found not guilty, which right. is the I think outrageous they, part, but is there some other reason that they... Uh, the, par the parole board can decide that he violated the law, even if he's acquitted in a jury trial or a trial before a judge. Um, the verdict will have some influence with them, but it's not binding on them. The, the, the conviction takes proof beyond a reasonable doubt. They need what they call a preponderance of the evidence. If all things, if you can picture a scale, if it tilts one way or the other way ever so slightly, then that side should prevail. Their standards, however, are very subjective. And they're not bound by rules of evidence, rules of procedure, there aren't any constitutional rights at a parole hearing, you have no right to remain silent, you have no right to face your accusers, you're really at the mercy of the parole board. Uh, and they're an authoritative group. I think that most law enforcement, when they heard the story, believed on its face that it was preposterous that Donna was guilty. I, I don't think a lot of people in law enforcement have moved from that position, but I also don't think they paid any attention to the trial. I think those of us who heard the trial, listened to it, heard the lawyers argue, saw that it wasn't so much that he wasn't proved guilty, it was that he was proven innocent. But that distinction uh, has so thus far failed to impress the parole board. Now, there are you, you great, great many instances where people who insist on their innocent are held simply for that, with the parole board saying they failed to acknowledge the consequences of their wrongdoing or take responsibility for their crime. In many cases, people are better off saying, I did it and I'm sorry, and this is what I'm doing to make up for it. And then the parole board says, okay, you're where you deserve a second chance. Now, you said earlier that the, the parole board wants to appear and feels that they are very just. Uh, yeah, I think anybody, given that in those positions, wants to have the subjective feeling that I'm a fair 
fair person, I'm an open-minded person, and I'm doing what I think is, is fair. I'll be guided by my conscience, and I know I have a responsibility to be fair. That being said, the present parole board seem to have been selected for their authoritative attitudes and for their severe judgments. I know I'm not sounding very optimistic here, and I wish I could be more, but the, the reality is, is that Donald is at their mercy. I don't think that they can fail to be impressed by the way that he has lived his life since he was uh, paroled from jail. That all the good that he's done in the community, nor do I think that they can avoid or fail to be impressed by the amount of support he has of people that know him and worked with him. They'll not, they'll not be so much impressed by 100,000 people signing his, his online petition because they'll dismiss them as social activists and extremists. But it's the people like Steve, people from the soup kitchen, who worked with him, who can acknowledge the transformation of his life from when he was a, a hardened criminal. And I think that they will have a hard time ignoring the fact that he, he didn't revert to drugs, he didn't come in with dirty drugs, he, he didn't, it wasn't a, he wasn't hanging around with bad people, he wasn't developing bad habits, his behavior right up to the time of arrest was consistent with a charitable, giving, kind, reformed a citizen who was contributing a great deal to the community. There are people who come out of our parole who do very well. And then they go back to drugs and they go right down very, very fast. But that didn't happen with them. I think most people in law enforcement think that he turned bad again. Then he went back to drugs, he went back to alcohol. Uh, he needed extra money because he was drugging. I don't think that, that's a knee-jerk reaction by law enforcement. And it, it's a stereotype, but it's based on some, some histories that people come out and do very well and then revert to crime and usually it's drugs or alcohol. They need 90%, over 90% it's drugs and alcohol. What makes Donald exceptional is he didn't go back to drinking and drugging and hanging around with the wrong people. And that, I think, should have significant impact on the members of the parole board as they look at his behavior and decide in their own mind whether he was involved with stolen property. Thanks. In my mind is this Amy Bookbinder. A role, or does or any role of racism play in this? Part of the, the stereotypes. I just wonder whether racism is rearing its ugly head once again in this situation. The, uh, well, I mean, I don't know how rearing its head. Racism closes its eyes and floods forward blindly. <laughs> uh, but the uh, racism is such an ingrained part of the criminal justice system that those in it don't even notice it. They. Uh, it's just, it predominates from the time law enforcement see a person of color walking down the street, they're suspected more, they're stopped more, they're searched more, they're arrested more, they're charged with more crimes, they're defended less vigorously, they're sentenced more heavily, the, their bail requests are higher, it's an epidemic. And the consequences are, you know, a third of our population, the jail population, is a person of color. Yep. Uh, when I started practicing law in the mid-70s, I was a, you know, I don't know, one of the flower children, you know, we're going to bring peace, peace and justice to the world. We, we had 200,000 people incarcerated in America. We had a generation that thought they were going to bring peace the world and we end up with two million now. I mean, it's uh, too many dropped out, in my opinion. <laughs> Turned on, dropped out, that was the rest of it. And we left the world to the Dick Cheney's. <laughs> <laughs>
Sure. <laughs> but it's. I was telling Steve, my own opinion is when the law started to require that people of color have equal rights to the civil rights movement, the racist attitudes of society made up for it by the war on drugs, the war on the poor. you spent six months in jail? Um, well, that was, I call that easy time, because that was my choice, pretty much. It was for School of the Americas protest. It was for what? School of the Americas protest in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. You asked Judge Ryan a good question, and I'm curious about what, what it is that's bringing you to this today. Well, uh, I have a little more understanding from Amherst to this. Um, so what's what's bringing you here, Russ? Well, I've lived in Amherst for more than 30 years. I spent 27 years as an elementary school principal. So I've dealt with some issues of people who break the rules, and issues of punishment and rehabilitation and all. Uh, but I first got to know Donald four or five years ago when he came to work at the soup kitchen uh, at the church that I go to, the First Congregational Church in Amherst. I've been a member there for a long time and I had different leadership roles in the church. Uh, but I got to know Don because I went to volunteer in the soup kitchen. Uh, I got a real sense of him and the quality of his leadership and the, the generosity and spirit of inclusion and respect that he created around everybody. Uh, so when Donald was first arrested, uh, it made no sense to me. You know, I understand if somebody is unemployed or going back to drugs or something, how, you know, it is possible to revert to a, a former problematic lifestyle, but, you know, Don was somebody, he had a great job, he was widely respected, uh, he wasn't using drugs, uh, and really was playing a tremendously positive role in the community. Uh, and part of what struck me, too, was at the church, uh, I didn't know how people would react to the fact that he'd been arrested. But the general sense was, we know Donald. We don't believe he did this, and we think when the facts come out, it's going to be clear that he's innocent, uh, which is exactly what happened in the trial, in my opinion. Uh, so knowing how unjust our justice system can be, uh, particularly to black men, uh, I feel uh, you know, personally called to do anything I can to try to prevent this injustice from continuing. And some of that is in the spirit of understanding that it's awfully likely
likely that if I were the one arrested under those circumstances, there's a good chance it never would have even gone to trial uh, and that I would be out free uh, today. Uh, so I'm... And, and how do you account for that, Russ? Well, I think the society still uh, affords all sorts of benefits to people who are white. The, well, essentially, the ideas that were sold to people 100, 200 years ago to justify slavery. You know, slavery has ended, but those ideas are still around and still get conditioned into people's minds. And, you know, even, even white people who don't want to have those ideas in their minds are still subject somewhat to them. So I think it takes a, a being conscious and being proactive as white people to uh, understand how racism operates in our society. And I'm frankly feeling very honored to be in this car with this group of people who has an understanding of some of these issues and is, uh, you know, being proactive and is going to this hearing on Donald's behalf. So Donald is on lifetime parole, and so the questions are, what is the function of the parole board? And secondly, how how are they chosen? Who comprises that board? Well, uh, let me answer the second question first because okay. it's far easier. Uh, parole board members are nominated by the governor and approved by the governor's council. The governor's council is a little known body that approves certain judicial appointments. All judges, uh, I think they even do notary publics. Uh, they, uh, Justice of the Peace, but they also <coughs> approve uh, the nominations to the parole board. We had an unfortunate situation about four years ago where uh, a man came up for parole and was granted parole. Uh, he had been a 30-year prisoner. And he had done very well in, inside. He became got a master's degree, became a drug counselor, was very active in counseling other inmates. Uh, he got a good job. He was paroled to it. Things went well for a couple of years, then he reverted to drugs. And he uh, was involved in a robbery where a police officer was killed. And the police in Massachusetts were outraged that this prisoner was released and they lobbied the governor and the governor uh, cleaned house at the parole board. They all came to work one day and there was state police there and they had a letter in front of them which was a resignation. They were told that the uh, governor wanted it if they didn't sign and resign voluntarily. Which governor was that? Could governor you? Patrick. Uh-huh. Thank you. He, um, it's, he had some very good people on that parole board, a few of who I knew. I thought there was a weak link. At some point, Governor Patrick had decided that his chauffeur, the state police, retired state police officer who had been driving around for three or four years, uh, deserved to be on the parole board, and he made him the head of the parole board. Uh, the weakness in the parole board to many observers seemed to be at the top, seemed to be that appointee of the governor that was purely on a political basis. But when he asked for the uh, chairman's resignation, the chairman only resigned if everyone else on the board did, and the governor supported that, so they cleaned 
once you're on parole, life parole, there's no getting off it in Massachusetts. Is that That's, right? You can be pardoned by the governor. So what have you got to say? Oh no, I'm wearing my lucky jacket. This is the jacket I wore on January 17th when Charles Ohai was found not guilty and he was able to walk home with his family. Yes, I'm not guilty. For the same, same thing. Positive vibe here in, in this place. What, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, I was, I'm the backup driver. I was going to be the driver. If the, yes, if the driver who drove us wasn't available. But, but I, just, I, just sat in the, I just sat in the passenger seat and navigated. So you're just right, you're just for, here for the ride? I, well, I was here for the ride, but also here because I know the situation. And I think it's just despicable that people would be imprisoned on it. On an accusation. So it's one thing, and then when the accusation was found in court to be unfounded, I mean, really, that is. I mean, the idea of holding someone after they've been found not guilty is beyond It's like belief. turning around a ship, isn't it? Like turning around an ocean liner. It takes, it in this case, I mean, it takes years. The, the institutional inertia that you get accused, and then, you know, it's like Kafka esque. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't even provide the appearance of justice, much less justice. So here we are with these are all the beautiful people who are here to support Don Perry in his parole hearing today. And what's today? Today is March 12, 2013. I wanted, uh, oh, one more? I would like Holly to go over the ground rules for the new people who have just sure. arrived about what you sure. can wear and stuff. And then I have a just a general message from Donald about uh, our attitude. So tell the rules, if you would. So no coats in the car? <laughs> Breaking the rules, Paige. <laughs> <laughs> Only your ID, no phones, no coats, no scarves, no phones, nothing but you, your clothing, and your ID. All the rest in the car. OK, and here is um, a request from Donald. Um, and also from Luke Bryan, Donald's a wonderful lawyer who can't be here today. And that is, that's hard, but we're going to do fine. Yeah. Uh, we are who we need to be. And here's the request from, from Donald is to remember that we are here for Donald, mm -hmm. not against the parole board. Mm -hmm. yep. And we are here to speak for Donald not to score points against the parole board mm -hmm. to make all of us feel good. Mm -hmm. They are human beings trying to do their job. We may not understand the way they do it or what they think their job is, but they're just as human and trying just as hard as we are. And we are here for one reason mm -hmm. and one person. Mm -hmm. And we have a very easy job. All we have to do is love him. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do is tell them how wonderful he is. So, and your your basic encouragement is that the likelihood is that they will say all sorts of bad things about his past. I think yes, the likelihood is that they will try to make him lose his temper, and we shouldn't lose ours. Right. Because if we do, it makes it look as though what they said was important or true, yeah. rather than they're just doing their antics to provoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If Donald yeah. loses his shit, he can't. Right, it's for him, but it's not for us to do yeah. in there at yeah. all, right? So and in there for yeah. us is just to be stoic. 
And if we're being stoic, it's going to make it know? easier for him That's not right. to lose his Sure. Yeah. Sure. So and even if knows. we ask egregious things and he responds in an egregious way back, like it's not for us to back him then. It's yeah. only for him to do whatever he's choosing to do while he's sitting up there. Yeah. We're, our role is to not do a thing except be stuck. Yeah, because yeah, there's two things. It's his body and the cell. Mm -hmm. And he knows more about this than we do. Yeah. How, how will we expect to learn their decision? As, is there a way that it, as a group we can... Not have to wait until word of mouth or something. Oh, we'll put out emails to all of you that we've already been in touch with, and we won't know for some time now. It could be months. I'm gonna pass something around um, so that I can get everybody's email addresses, phone numbers, and I'm gonna make sure that I keep getting all that information out to people as it goes through each different um, system or you know whatever we hear no news, right. what's going on. Um, Do you have anything more you'd like to say? I just, I just, I'm going to cry because um, <laughs> this has just been such a long, hard thing for us to go through and to have the support of so many people, um, it just means the world to us, you know, just to feel supported, you know, we felt really alone in the beginning and we know we're not alone and I said to Donald this morning, you're not in this by yourself, we're all going to be there for you, so he sounded really happy. So, thank you everybody. Uh, they'll bring people in in small groups and screen them as they go. The less stuff you have to carry, the quicker everybody will get in. Uh, you are not allowed to carry in cell phones, pagers. I said, does anybody still have a pager? <laughs> uh, computers, uh, items like that. And everyone will need a picture ID to get in. So, if, uh, you know, they'll try to process as quickly as possible. And, uh, Cooperative, respectful, and uh, no matter uh, how much it grinds and how much we have to bite our tongues, uh, they have absolute power. So we, uh, we want to be respectful and, uh, and just supportive of, of Donald. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, uh, there's another hearing going on, and they'll start to take us in once say the other hearing's over. And the sooner we get in there, the sooner they'll be able to, to start it. Okay. Anybody ask him questions? Four witnesses then speak on Donald's behalf. Each one will be given five minutes, and then Donald uh, will be required to allow uh, six minutes. All right, we'll take another five. Whoever wants to come in and sign in next. Okay. Just do some